All right, what is up, everybody? Welcome back to another installment of the Vortex Nation podcast, podcast, I should say, which you might actually think is the Onyx Maps podcast, because whenever we do anything surrounding hunting, hunting topic related, it seems like we always go back to some involvement and usage of Onyx Maps, because it really is just such a cool tool with so many different layers a person oh, can use. I, I see what that, you did Jim. there. So today we're fortunate. We're super stoked to be joined by uh, Dylan and Jared from Onyx Maps. And we're going to talk kind of maybe everything Onyx mapping. We're going to talk about the tool, how to use it, uh, maybe some unique uses that people might not be aware of, maybe any you know new stuff that you guys have coming out. I know I got a, I was actually uh, Onyxing. That's what I call it uh, when I'm at home. I'm Onyxing. I, it's, it's a verb now. And uh and uh, you guys served me up something where I was like, hey, these new things, but I, I would, was short on time. And so I actually had to click through it without finding out what the new stuff was. So maybe you guys can fill us in on that. But that sounds like pretty much most things for you, Mark. Short on <laughs> no. time, Jim. Oh, my computer has updates. It's had updates for the last year. Just shuffle through that. Don't worry about it. Yeah, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. The machine uh, will figure it out. Yeah. They're self-learning, <laughs> autonomous creatures. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've seen, machines. I've seen Terminator 2. Um, gentlemen, before we dive too deep, why don't you introduce yourselves, tell us a little bit about who you are, what you're about, what you do for Onyx, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll start there. Yes, we'll go alphabetically. So, uh, Dylan, you can go first. Cool. I'll kick it off. Um, so, yeah, Dylan Dowson, like you said there. Um, so, kind of quick background for me. I was uh, born and raised in Montana, so I'm a Montana native. Um, haven't left the state. And I grew up on the eastern side of Montana, which is much, much different than where we're at now, Jared and I, uh, currently, which is in Missoula, Montana, where Onyx headquarters are are based out of. Um, we do also have an office in Bozeman, um, but we work out of the Missoula office. So basically grew up um, hunting, you know, like my dad at a super young age introduced me to hunting. I think I was like four or five when I was tagging along um, on his mule deer antelope hunts and everything in Eastern Montana. And so when I had the opportunity to, to work for on X, like it was just a no brainer. Um, and that's been a little over five years ago now. So about five years and a couple months, um, I started out in customer service. Uh, Jared and I actually started pretty similar paths. I'm sure he'll get into on his end, but, um, started out in customer service. And at the time I was kind of like, a a one man customer service. Um, we've grown a lot in the last five years and have had a lot of changes, but started out answering the phones and emails um, and did that for a couple of years and then worked, worked my way into the marketing side of things. So um, now I am fortunate enough to work with like our Western, I w mostly work with the Western folks. Uh, Western big game is kind of my cup of tea here, um, but our ambassadors, any Western big game marketing communications going out, um, you know, a lot of trade show community activities, et cetera. So uh, it's been a, an awesome five years at Onyx and the company's grown a ton um, as well as the product. Cool. Awesome, man. Yeah. And I actually grew up uh, in Waupon, Wisconsin. So just North of Vortex HQ there of uh, certainly driven by it on the highway a time or two and thrown a wave out. Um, and then I actually <laughs> went to, went to school in Ames, Iowa, purely to acquire resident deer tags, uh, like in the state of know. Iowa Sounds for about right. four years in college. Uh, my aunt has a pretty sweet farm that her grandparents homesteaded in the Western part of the state there. And, uh, that's where I actually became familiar with on X chasing snow geese on spring breaks, you know, finding fields and, stumbled across the app one day and, uh, you know, two years down the road, I applied for a, a customer support job right after school. I just wanted to get West to the mountains and the rivers, um, and check out this part of the country and got the job. And fortunately only had to spend nine months in uh, customer support. That's a, it's, it's an interesting job all fall. It's super fun to talk to the customers that are using the product and, and putting it to work, but it's uh, it's busy. You know, you got that many customers, especially with our demographic and it being a piece of technology, there's uh, no shortage of, of calls and emails for our support team to answer. And really cool part about Onyx is that we do have live, you know, support right here in Missoula, Montana. I think we're close to 20 folks in our support that you can, you know, call and get on the phone with a real person just about immediately. So, um, but yeah, as Dylan said, he kind of leads the Western big game strategy. I lead the whitetail waterfowl turkey strategy. 
Um, so working with a lot of our partners that are in the, you know, quote unquote, regional part of the country. So um, that's kind of what I do at OnX. And yeah, it's been a super fun ride. Bunch of like-minded folks that all love to get outdoors and create a product that empowers others to do so as well. Cool. Awesome. We got a good variety of folks here then. And Mark, also, it's it's got to be comforting for you to know you're not the only one who can't work technology. Well, you know what? And I was just about to compliment these guys because Onyx actually is a piece of technology I can work, or maybe actually I just cared enough to figure it out. But it is super user friendly. Yeah. So there's there's uh, if I can do it, anybody can do it. It is. It is. Yeah. Did we mention Eric's here too? <laughs> yes. Oh. Hey. Hi, Eric. <laughs> I think you hit the nail on the head there with uh, you care enough to figure it out. Um, that's a lot of our customers and Jared and myself know, you know, with the background in customer service, but it can be a little intimidating at first for a few folks, you know, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, my dad or, you know, just people who didn't grow up with a cell phone in their hand, you know, relying on their cell phone now in the woods, uh, it can be intimidating and it can be like a leap of faith. Um, but, you know, that is one of our jobs is to make it as intuitive, as easy as possible for people to grasp. And really, you know, what I even said back in customer service days is like, if you give it a chance, if you, you know, dive in, you're not going to break it. If you just tap every button, see what things do, you know, obviously we've got customer support. Give us a call if you have any issues, questions, concerns. But, you know, if you give it the time and if you sit down for 30, 45 minutes, pre-season with it and just touch buttons and figure out what it does. Like you're going to be confident going into season with it. Yeah. Yeah. It really is pretty straightforward. And I guess for, you know, for those who may not be as familiar as we are, maybe give us a rundown of like what, what is on X maps? Yep. Yeah. hundred percent. I mean, we specialize in, in land ownership data. I mean, that's our bread and butter is, is public and private land ownership data. Uh, and that's obviously, you know, people think, that it's more of a Western product. And of course we were born in the West and you know, the West has so much unmarked public land that's impossible to, to differentiate without our product. Um, but I've actually found a ton of use for it in the whitetail woods, you know, just yep. checking your boundary lines and, you know, setting up a property and understanding your property through topography. Like, I mean, topographic maps is something I totally to, you know, wasn't even that much on my radar growing up um, in the Midwest, but you look at a topo map and then you look at a piece of property, like to understand why critters are moving where they are becomes super obvious. Um, but so beyond that, I mean, we go into so many layers. I mean, for those coming out West, we have historic wildfire data, roadless areas, wilderness. So it really just allows you to customize uh, the trip you're looking for and be able to set that up, you know, from the comfort of your home and then, you know, take that data with you in your pocket. That way you have it all at your fingertips. Um, and, you know, like walk-in hunting areas have become super popular in the last few years, like Kansas, Weeha, uh, you know, Montana has block management. Wisconsin has some of that man managed forest cropland. Yep. Um, all those layers, you know, we partner with those state agencies to get that data into the app. Um, and we're constantly trying to add and, and find more relevant and useful layers and features as such. Um, and then, I mean, to go into the tool set a little bit, uh, the ability to use the phone offline with no service is obviously the one that rings true for so many folks. Uh, simply tap the offline button, hover over the area you want to save, hit save, and you no longer have a need for a GPS. Um, you know, saves that right onto your phone. You get the topo hybrid and satellite base maps along with every single layer automatically saves. Um, and then just go into, you know, using waypoints and drawing lines to measure out how far your hike in or walk into the tree stand is going to be hike to the glassing knob, whatever it may be, drawn area shapes to plant food plots. Um, and then, you know, you of course have the tracker tool, which just leaves you a breadcrumb. Great for getting back to the truck. If you're in unfamiliar terrain, especially in the dark, uh, you know, I I'm sure you guys could, could list a few features that you put to use as well. Yeah. Well, I think, I think what you're getting at is it answers the question that probably every single new hunter, especially and experienced hunter in a new area or honestly, even experienced hunters around here will sometimes oh, yeah. pull something up and find something that's five miles away that we never realized was there. Mm -hmm. uh, but the question that all these people ask, which is where should I go? Yeah. Where, where can I go? Or where you know? can I go even? You yeah. Know? And I think, uh, I, th one of the, to me, at least I know, like, even though I hunted, right. Like my barrier 
or I could see like even my barrier to finding places is like, where can I go? Or as a new hunter, I mean, that question is like one of the biggest barriers to entry, right? Like, yeah. where can I go? And that really does answer that question. You can answer those questions for yourself from your couch, from the comfort of your own home. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I'll turn it on while I'm actually driving around just looking for spots. You know, like, oh, I've never driven down this road before. I wonder, I wonder what's public off to the right or left, right. you know, and you well, yeah, glance I mean, down, you know, going at a safe rate of speed, of course. <laughs> uh, oh, we I call that on driving. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Or if you got somebody in the passenger seat and you just look over and you think that looks really cool and you bring up Onyx, can I go over there? And it's yeah. always a question worth uh, worth pondering. And a lot of times, you know, if you're, I know when we've gone out west and you see some just awesome looking place, uh, there's a way to get there, uh, and it's pretty cool. You know, it's not easy to find from where you are, but when you get that bird's eye view and you can yep, scroll yep. around a lot, you can start seeing ways to get in and where you can go and stuff. So yeah, some of those access points to even super large tracks are just a sliver, right? And if you can find oh, yeah. that that sliver, you can get into some some really yeah. cool stuff. I know, and I know for me, when I moved to Wisconsin, so I'm a transplant here, um, initially, like, I was pretty discouraged, right? I'm like, oh, my gosh, you look at all this agricultural land, everything's locked up in private, you're going to have to get permission or get a lease. And then once I really started exploring, you know, the features of Onyx, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. No, there's plenty of public land out here. You know, in fact, yep. there's there's quite a bit and there's some some really good stuff. So I know it really um, has been a savior for me personally, um, you know, and and just with my personal hunting around here. I'm surprised Mark, of all people, would say that on a podcast. Yeah. There's so much public land around here. Yeah. I'm getting better, Jim. <laughs> and actually, just an interesting discussion point with talking about public land in Wisconsin, uh, we actually just released an access report. Um, you guys may or may not be familiar, yep. but we did a, a landlocked report. What was that, last year or two years ago on uh, some of the major western states? And then yep. we just did another one on Wisconsin and Minnesota on the landlocked lands in the Midwest, which, I mean, Wisconsin has 55,000 acres and Minnesota has, I think it was like 254,000 yep. acres. Oof. So. Um, you know, that, that's a big access initiative has become a, a major component of Onyx. Our founder, actually, Eric Siegfried is just super passionate about, you know, access to these public lands that are yours and ours and everyone's that we are unable to use. Um, and, and so this access initiative has been something really cool that Onyx has, has started here. I think that kind of yeah. gets into one thing that I've found so mind bending when I try to imagine what the behind the scenes is like for Onyx and you guys over there. Um, because in order to find stuff like that, data on uh, landlocked pieces of public and whatnot, or, or even just be compiling all the data that goes into the private and public lands and boundaries and I mean, you're even throwing in fire data and all this other stuff, um, logging that's happened. Uh, do you guys have like a team of a thousand people on the backside <laughs> that are just like researching all this data? Because I mean, when we go into the newer hunter or just somebody who's not as savvy with where to find a lot of this information, I mean, I I know that it is obviously it has to be findable, but that's a lot. That you, that's a ton of work that has to go in on your guys' side to be finding all yeah. this stuff. Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the areas that we really pride ourselves on um, is we have an extensive, you know, it's not a thousand like you said there, but okay. we've got an extensive <laughs> uh, GIS team. And, you know, within that team, we have people specifically dedicated to reaching out. So not only to find that data, but then also to keep it updated, right? So we have all 50 states you know, every county, every parcel, um, for the most part that we have to constantly update because it doesn't do any good for us to find all that data, put it in the product. And then, you know, 10 years later, maybe think about doing an update. We have to make sure it's updated every year to the best of our abilities and the data that's out there. And so, you know, we, we've got a pretty large GIS team that works on specifically that finding new data, whether it's specific hunt data, like fire data, um, the, the walk-in units, as Jared alluded to, you know, migration routes, et cetera, or bringing it all the way back to the basics and just strictly private public. Mm -hmm. You know, if, a, if, you know, public doesn't typically change as often, but it does change. Um, but private specifically, you know, people are buying and selling pieces of land, farms, ranches every year, um, throughout the country. And so we, 
we pride ourselves on the ability to uh, take the time and the resources it takes to um, update those at least once a year per state. Um, and yeah, it's, it, it's a lot of work, but it's something that we have recognized at Onyx that it's extremely important um, because if you're going out there and you're trusting, you know, this tool, you're relying on this tool and it's not as up to date as the, you know, possibly another data source, it's just not going to be a good situation. Yeah. And just to piggyback off of that a little bit, Jimmy, you were alluding to us working with like state agencies and stuff like that, um, you know, with walk-in hunting areas and, and historic wildfires. And, and a lot of times, like, for instance, let's say Wisconsin, you know, with the managed forest croplands, they're usually pretty excited about sharing that data with us because they've gone through the time and effort to collect it. And the more people that, you know, can get eyes on it and use that, the better the program is going to be mm-hmm. and, and more well funded. So, you mm-hmm. know, that's, those are partnerships that we lean on a ton throughout the country. I mean, we, we have really close working relationships. I don't know the exact number of states, but a, quite a few number of states, we have like close knit relationships with their, you know, government agencies where all their game wardens are hooked up with the app, you know, their state biologists, this, that, and the yeah. other thing. That's cool. Cause yeah, I mean, the, if we know much about government agencies now that goes, it's not like they're going to go making a government agency app, you know, of their own. Yeah. Well, that, they that did separately. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, you know, what do I, know? what do I know? <laughs> clearly, clearly, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I missed I, I missed out on uh, seeing that one. But. I, I spent a year at uh, the Wisconsin DNR prior to coming over to Vortex, and the running joke there is the like the DNR tried to make an app that had similar data with like public private landowner, you know, when to use parks, all that stuff. Nobody knows about it, so that <laughs> that is a that is a credit to the success of Onyx. Yeah, yeah, they should what, want to what use. What were you the- doing? Uh, what were you doing at the DNR office? So I was the uh, social media manager over there, and uh, then transitioned over to Vortex in a similar role. So uh, yeah, that that was my background there. But yeah, the the funny story there is like the the whole goal was like let's make an app that's going to compete with Onyx and it just you know you can't <laughs> so the, especially when you're a state agency so right. Right. <laughs> right but that is it is a good uh, like caveat there because you know one thing that we had at at uh, DNR was you know we had uh, a map called the flight map and basically that had like timber harvest and aspen cuts and like all these different things that you know, obviously factor in on X and what's cool is, you know, you'd have to be a, a web scientist to be able to find that data on the DNR website. Uh, it is publicly available, but you can then look at on X and find all that stuff Mm -hmm. and it just puts it there in the heads up display. So whether you're looking for a, a a place to hunt, you know, deer in the big woods where, you know, a timber cut is going to be your, your thing to go to, or just like in the South find, you know, privately owned pieces that are open to the public that's all there and that you know even though it is publicly accessible it's way more easy you know on on what you guys have Mm -hmm. so those landowner names too though like you know i mean i i I love 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 public land and hunting public land but i'm certainly not anti-private land right and and uh you know we'll take advantage of hunting a, a sweet private spot and and sometimes you know you're shifting on the fly you know maybe you see a big buck out in a field or you're curious about a certain piece and you're like, man, who owns this? But there's not even, but then oftentimes the farmhouse isn't there. Right. So, but you can sometimes, I know I've, you know, futzed around and then you find, you know, maybe an adjacent piece of property that does have the house on it. You kind of corroborate the two names and then you know who to ask over here so you can hunt over there. So it's just, I don't know. It's, I, I spend a lot of hours. The thing that's neat is like you guys hit on the access issues that, you know, you're like, your brand has values on like, you know, increasing access. And like, here we are right now. I mean, I don't think there's ever been a time where license sales is, is, are as increased as they are in the year 2020, Mm -hmm. given everything that we've got going on. So from a new hunter tool, there's nothing better than, you know, feeling like you can actually figure out where to go. You know, if you just told somebody to like, Hey, here's Southwest Wisconsin, Southeast Montana, whatever, like go find a spot to hunt. It's not really going to happen, but they, they're going to need to refer some kind of, you know, oh, man. mapping technology. Mm-hmm. And and that's what's neat is like technology is caught up to the point where now it's empowering new new people who are trying to get involved in the sport. Yeah. Yeah. You nailed that. For one, sure. Man. I mean, if somebody was to ask me, like, what do you need to go hunting? This would be like one of like the five items. It's like, OK, you're going to need your 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 implement 
set of boots, obvious, yeah. of course, Jim. And then uh, and then Onyx, because that rifle or bow ain't going to do you any good if you don't know where you can go. Yep. No, and, th- and then there is a bit of a mental block at times, too, going in certain places with, like, a rifle. You know, you think to yourself, hey, am I really supposed to be here? You know, mm-hmm. am I really, really supposed to be here because I don't want to start accidentally trespassing with a gun, you know, or something like that and, and have this potentially look bad and get myself in bad trouble. Um, cause sometimes there's spots where I know, I know there's one fairly locally here where I remember I had to, uh, I found it on Onyx, uh, and, um, ended up, ended up going to check it out in person. And I remember thinking to myself, like, there's no way, like they, they, <laughs> that, this, this feels weird. Like if I, I would have never guessed, but you know, when you actually look it up and you see it all and it, it was legit, yep. it's, it could be a potentially great little spot to go. When you're like closing your car door in a neighborhood and then like <laughs> walking in, is that kind of what you're describing, Jim? <laughs> maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe a little bit, but, uh, but yeah, it is, it is very helpful in that regard. Yeah. yeah. And, and the other thing I love is always, you know, I love about our product is it's, 30 bucks, you know, it's like potentially the cheapest piece of gear that you're going to buy all season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially, you know, in regards to a tank of gas or boots or, you know, a box of bullets for 60 bucks or whatever it is, like Jared said, there are 30 bucks to know where you can and can't go. And that's one thing I wanted to do for a second is almost take it back just a little bit further. And it's like, even if, you know, on the lines of a new hunter, right? So if you take a new hunter up to the the mountains or wherever and say, okay, you have 10 miles this way or even 80 miles this way where you can go, like this is public land, you got the right tag, go. Like they're, they're not going to have the confidence to just just go. So not only like the, the data to find out where they can and can't hunt based off game management units, public, private, et cetera, but also just like taking it back to the simple GPS functionality of the app. Like, oh, huge. It, yeah. So, you know, as Jared said earlier, you can save it for offline use. You don't have cell service. You don't have any way to connect. You know, you can still see the full map. But a lot of times people don't realize until they use it, like you can still see your GPS location. Mm-hmm. You know, you can see yourself on that map. So you can mark a waypoint at the truck so you know how to get back. You can track yourself as you drop down into that canyon. Um, you know, where you might lose sense of direction a little bit or not be super confident in your abilities, um, you know, you've got to track. So not only is it like, okay, finding public, finding a game management unit that allows this particular tag, but just like the simplistic GPS capabilities of the app that I think until people use it the first time, they don't quite realize that. It's true. Well, on the level of detail, right? Like you know, I've got, you know, a, a, a actually a really good GPS, right? But the detail on, you know, with my Onyx functionality is like, it's just way greater. You just can see more stuff right. going on behind, you know, aside from like maybe just contour lines or something like that. And and you nailed it. I mean, for a person like myself who was born without a sense of direction, that GPS functionality is like very, very, very important. Yeah. You know, being able to drop that track and, and that track, to me also is super important because wherever you wherever you find your way into, right? That's also you know that's a way out. And right. some of this terrain it can be a little bit, you know, a little bit rugged or maybe it could be cliffy or whatever yep. and you know maybe you are coming out at night and it's tough to see and to be able to look down and be like, "Yep, I'm going in the way I came or I'm coming out the way I came in is, you know, gives you a high level of, of confidence yeah. there that you're going to be able to get back out to your truck or where yeah. you're trying to get to. Yeah, we had uh, or a year ago, two years ago, I shared a deer camp in southeast Montana. And some of the folks in camp were, were older folks who just had grown up, you know, using GPS units and the whole handheld deal and all that stuff. And, you know, once they saw me like, you know, going around on my phone, they're like, what the heck is going on here? Like, how can we figure this out? So, you know, kind of sat down and, and showed them like the ins and outs of like that offline version. And just from like a gear consolidation standpoint, mm-hmm. it's huge because, you know, I, I mean, here we are in the day and age where everyone's counting ounces, like a really good thing to leave at home. Or even if you do want to pack it along as a backup is that GPS. I mean, one is, you know, none, two is one. So just if you can have some kind of operational system there, you know, where you've got components that back each other up, or you can take something else out of your pack and use your phone. Everyone's got one, you know, that is huge. And now Mm -hmm. here, fast forward two years later, that same group of guys that are, I think, all in their 50s, they've all transitioned over to using their iPhones. So it's neat to see even like, we always talk about new hunters, but here's, you know, a, a 
group of guys that have been doing it for forever, and now they're just finally starting to, you know, make that switch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it is neat. I mean, yeah, we talk a lot about dual purpose functionality, and that's really like, qua- I mean, you've got your camera, your GPS. Yep. You know, I mean, so much. You know, your land ownership, your public private communication. I mean, there's there's a lot of built into into one piece of equipment. I always say, mm-hmm. man. It, of course, you know, it almost makes me nervous because I have consolidated so many of those things in my phone. I'm like. Man, I better not lose my phone. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we I did exactly that this summer. I flew into the Frank Church a few weeks ago to go fishing in Idaho. And uh, day two, I had a, a little chest zipper pocket. I was keeping my phone in, into the river, never to come out. Oh, oh no. no. <laughs> I'm panicking but, just it, thinking about you know, it. I know, yeah. Mark. Yeah, I think you would end up just being left there. Well, well. But thankfully, I knew which direction the airstrip was, so it, it, you know I could get back. <laughs> that's that's definitely good. You know, you guys were talking about your your bearings too, and and the ease that I'm like a constant Onyx advertisement, but the, the ease with the ease with which you can like drop pins though, and and keep your bearings. Like you said, you know, you drop off the hill, everything looks different, right? So if you are trying to make a stock on an animal, or you're just trying to get from point A to point B because mm-hmm. you want to check something out, to be able to maybe drop a pin of where you're trying to get to from a location where, where you maybe can see a lot better before you dump down into the timber or something like and get that bearing and know that you're heading in the right direction. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, mm-hmm. I don't know, it's super handy. You hit on a good thing there, though, that like like with dropping pins and all that, and I'm curious to get your guys' thoughts on this because one thing that I feel like I have always struggled with is an, a good organizational system. I'm not a hyper-organized person, mm-hmm. so if you pull up my Onyx, it's like my the state of Wisconsin has chronic chicken pox. Oh, dude, pin vomit. So, like, how, like <laughs> I, I, I know there's some... some uh, you know, stuff there that you guys have as far as like color coordination and not now obviously these different uh, waypoint types by by different category or whatever. What are some tips that you guys usually give folks that are trying to like stay organized and consolidate those pins? Yeah. So I'll, uh, I'll touch on kind of what we have right now and then I'll let Jared kind of touch on like what we are working on currently that might solve quite a few issues with that. So current process now, you know, you can mark a waypoint um change the the icon type jared do you know how many we have is it like 40 some no i think it's almost close it's 60 something okay so seven yeah and so for that i mean i you have the generic x when you uh drop a waypoint and then you can change the icon type so you can choose elk bull deer shed you know trail camera water whatever it is um you've got a lot of different options there but then also on top of that um you can change the color. So one of the ways that I do it personally is I've actually got a few different methods that I combine and it works for me. Everybody likes to do it differently. Um, But if I'm looking at a new area and I haven't checked it out or verified it yet, I'll mark that uh, waypoint yellow. It's just the color that I use for that. Um, So those are like unverified, you know, e-scouting waypoints, for example. Then when I go in there, Say if it's an elk wallow or an elk water source, I go in there, I e-scout or e-scout it, then put boots on the ground in there. I verify it. I like it. I'll change that uh, waypoint to red. Mm -hmm. So like I color code by species. I hunt, you know, bear and elk a lot in the same area. Um, Some places deer and elk. And as you said, you know, you pull up the map. I've got hundreds and hundreds of waypoints. And from a quick visualization, it can be like you said, chicken pocky. Um, so I, I do that, you know, I do choose one color for one species, one color for another. I know a lot of guys will color code based on the year. So if oh, they're wow. mm. yeah, primarily elk hunters, you know, their 2018 waypoints might be uh, yellow, 2019 might be red, then blue, et cetera, just to differentiate and be able to tell, okay, like, here's where this, you know, this herd was last year. Here's where I was seeing sign this year, et cetera. Um, and then to dive in a little bit further, you can name and add notes to each one of those waypoints. So you can name it, you know, elk wallow number two or camera setup three, drop in some notes with, you know, what you were seeing that day as far as weather, et cetera. So you can customize there quite a bit. And then as of recent, um, pretty recent anyways, you can actually go in and you can filter those icons. So if you have, you know, deer icons, a certain color elk icons, another, if I'm going into elk season here in a, in a couple of weeks and I just want to see my elk icons, 
I can go in and filter just that color waypoints. So then, you know, your map goes from 300 waypoints in a clustered area to just my elk waypoints down to 80 or whatever it is. So that's a little bit of an overview of like what we currently have. But um, Jared, do you want to touch on a few up and coming projects? Yeah. And I mean, Mark, this kind of alludes to uh, our, our little in-app message that you didn't have time for. Uh, yeah. But it was killing so, me too. Cause I was like, I was trying to find something. I was doing something specific and uh, yeah, I was like, Oh my God, I want to know. And I'm like, Oh, we'll talk to those guys tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> you're not alone. Um, so actually, our, you know, the user experience right now when you drop a waypoint is, you know, you have to drop your waypoint, choose your icon, then save it. Then you can go back and edit it, which is just obviously not intuitive. So we actually recreated that. That's going to be available super, super shortly, um, where as soon as you make a waypoint, there's an option to add your photo, change the color, change the icon, awesome. you know, add notes right off the bat, um, as well as you're going to have your your uh, recently used icons are going to be in the front of the icon list. Mm. So if you're looking for a trail camera and you've dropped eight trail cameras in the last week, trail camera is going to be sitting on your doorstep rather than 65 waypoints over all the way down in the T's. Nice. Oh, nice. Uh, cool. Cool. So, so that's coming on the pipe. I mean, it should be here literally any day now. Um, that'll come out with the next update. But then, I mean, to piggyback off of that, I mean, obviously the, the ability to filter colors and icons and stuff is certainly helpful. Um, but we are working on some ways that you're going to be able to categorize your waypoints um, potentially in, in a collection or a folder. We're not exactly sure what it's going to look like yet. Um, but the, you know, the ability to have all your turkey waypoints compressed and, you know, with the flip of a switch, be able to turn on all your turkeys and turn everything else off or, you mm. know, all your elk, whatever it may be, whether it's a particular color or a particular icon, um, you know, going to try to make it as expansive and, you know, cater it to the different ways, different customer customers organize their content. Nice. Um, so, so hopefully more of that coming down the pipeline. Um, and then, you know, while we're on it, we might as well, we might as well tease out the other few features that, uh, that Mark missed there, huh, Dylan? Yeah. Yeah. Please, so I'll take, please uh, do. I'll take the one I'm most excited about, and then you can follow up with a few others. Um, obviously in the West and, you know, it's helpful everywhere, but you know, you can see a big buzz around 3d yep. and, you know, a lot of people are still reverting back to like Google earth and, checking out 3D and then relying on Onyx to, for in-field navigation and for e-scouting topo. Well, instead of, you know, moving forward with that, we decided to just like take it, take it upon ourselves to build it internally. And so coming shortly will be like a 3D beta, um, kind of like a testing period out for, for 3D. And I've had the pleasure of using it. Um, I recently, just this past weekend, went on the first hunt of fall 2020 for me and I was checking out the area in 3d ahead of time on our, our system that we have access to before it goes to the public. Nice. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's going to be super helpful. I mean, it's, it's going to be a work in progress in the beginning. Um, we've got some pretty high aspirations of what, what it's going to be when we're done with it. Um, but yeah, we're, we're pretty excited to get that one out the door. That sounds hot. Yep. That's that it awesome. does. Yeah. I mean, 3D can be used. I don't care if you're hunting whitetails in Alabama, hunting turkeys in Maine or elk in Montana. You know, I think everybody's got a use case to see, you know, real view terrain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and then a, another one, another one we have coming down the pipe is, you know, saved maps. Currently, uh, we've improved that whole experience and that'll be coming out. I'm pretty sure on the same release as the new uh, Waypoint user experience. Um, but it's just going to get you far more in depth with your saved maps. Like you're going to be able to queue up as many saved maps as you want and just tell them to save and they'll just continuously save rather than having to save one, go back in, choose your next one, save that one. Um, you also are going to have the ability to choose an area on web map and have it sent straight to all of your devices connected to that account, your iPad, your iPhone, whatever it may be. Um, and it's going to send that area straight to your phone. So while you're e-scouting, if you're like, I know I want to check this area out, you can outline your saved map. It's going to send straight to your phone. You'll get a nice. notification, you hit download, and you're good to go. 
um, as well as just some other user interface things to show, you know, show your maps that you have currently saved, ones that are partially saved, uh, a whole bunch of improvements that are going to make the maps faster to save because we've all sat in that gas station with two yep. bars of LP <laughs> and waited 20 minutes for a map to save. So yep. uh, those improvements are coming as well as uh, um, just the amount of size that a saved map takes up is nice. going to be less as well just because there's folks with those you know, those iPhone sevens that have 16 gigabytes worth of data and 14 gigs of their data are on X. So, yep. so we're trying to, we're trying to help those <laughs> folks out uh, and free up some space with saved maps. That's Very awesome. Cool. I'd be like, yeah, pictures of the family. <laughs> can part ways with them. <laughs> I think the wife yeah. printed those at some point. Yeah, priorities. Um, you guys have brought up a term uh, a couple times now that I think is another feature of Onyx that I, I, I see uh, being used more and more. Um, And I think that if uh, we talked a lot about the beginner hunter, for example, but I think that as you become a more experienced hunter, this this is more of a, uh, I'd say, intermediate to advanced use of Onyx, which is e-scouting. Like when I first downloaded Onyx, my initial thing was just look for the right color, you know, just look for the colorful little blocks. And that just means you can go there. And if you can go there, go there. Right. And then just set up wherever right and so this this is uh, based on a lot of just like not understanding how when you look at the topo how all that actually can determine where deer might be or where they might be going or coming from um how they might be moving across certain pieces of property uh you look at bunches of trees and stuff like that or where ag land is uh, these are all things that I think you start to learn one, the more you go hunting and the more that you observe and sort of download in your own brain, what you're seeing. Uh, but, uh, two, as you begin to understand, uh, what a lot of the things that you see on maps mean and, and how they can affect, uh, the quarry you're after. So I know you like you guys, and I've even started to a little bit, you guys all do a ton of e-scouting. Um, what is it that, uh, what is it that you do? I mean, it, you don't even necessarily have to be in, well, you don't, the whole point is that you don't have to be in the place you're about to go in order to at least start getting an idea for what you might encounter, uh, which is pretty huge, yep. um, and, and pretty significant. Uh, what are you guys doing? What, what do you say for somebody who wants to start actually having maybe a higher quality understanding of what they're about to get into by utilizing the app to e-scout. Yeah. So I think first and foremost, another misconception is we've got two different programs. So we've got, you know, the phone app and then the web version for e-scouting when in all reality, it's the same thing. So if you purchase an app, you have access to the same maps on web, on your desktop, on your computer. Um, I've even sometimes you know, transition that to my big screen TV to just look at something in even a bigger picture. So, you know, as you alluded to from the comforts of your home, you know, you can sit and you can study these units and study these ridge lines and figure out where you want to go. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing too, especially for folks in like Jared's neck of the woods, you know, in the, the region, the, the Eastern, the Midwest, those folks coming out to West, for example, you might only get five days off. You might get one week off and you're headed out to Colorado on an elk hunt. And the last thing that those folks want to do is have all that expense, take that time off work, head out to Colorado and spend the first two to three to four days figuring out where you can access. And, you know, this road leads into public, can access or leads into private, can access the public from this road. Let's try this one. Like, If you do e-scouting properly, you can figure out 90% of that ahead of the time. So when you get out there, instead of spending the first couple of days at least scouting out and trying to find areas that are of interest to you, you're just like boots on the ground, you know, getting after it. Um, And so one of the things that I would strongly encourage people to do, and one of our big initiatives for this year is Jared and myself have worked with our marketing department and our brand team internally at Onyx to set up kind of like a, a e-scouting web page from our ambassadors. Um, and so that's, you know, we've got one for the whitetail guys, the, the waterfowl guys, et cetera. And then one for like the Western big game guys. And really it's our ambassadors and the people that we work with diving in how they break it out. So 
you know, somebody might be talking specifically about archery elk in a few different states. You know, we've got a few on mule deer coming, um, et cetera. So it really breaks it down from like the pros, if you will, how they're utilizing Onyx on their computer ahead of time. Um, Cause it's the same thing for them, right? You know, they're, they're trying to capture content and they don't want to spend the first half of their trip trying to figure out if they're in a good spot or not. So they have to utilize their, their time wisely um, before going off to another hunt or whatever they're doing after that. Um, so I would urge people definitely to check out some of those videos and some of that content. But I know for me, you know, it's, it, it all starts with like where you can hunt, right? Like back to our initial conversation of, you know, I've got a, a general unit or a general tag in Colorado. Like what units does that even mean I can hunt? So with just a little bit of research on like Colorado, Colorado's website, you know, I can find a list of units, will then pull up my Onyx and immediately start Xing out areas that I can't hunt. It's like, okay, that unit 203, that unit is a draw only unit. Okay. I'm going to put maybe a a black waypoint on that, just indicating I can't even hunt that. I'm not going to spend time. So really just kind of starting out super broad and narrowing in to a unit. And then even then it's like, okay, where can I access the public? If I'm public land hunting, what interests me? You know, what am I going to be doing? Am I going to be archery hunting, rifle hunting? Well, if I'm rifle hunting, I'm going to be looking for a little bit more open terrain where I can sit up and my my rifle tactics, the way I like to rifle hunt, you know, elk is sit up in glass like all day. And so I'm not going to be looking for a part of the unit that's extremely dense timber um, where that's just not going to be a possibility. So there's a lot of different ways to approach it, obviously. Um, but marking waypoints and, and figuring out ahead of time, that way, when you do get there, you've got like a option one, option two, option three, and if you go to option one and there's a lot of people at that trailhead or you, it's just not what you thought it was, okay, scratch it. Let's go to option two. Um, so that way you're just, you're benefiting your time, uh, maximizing your time in the field once you get out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's super huge. Yeah. And to call out a couple of specific of those scouting projects that I know are cross collaborative partners with, mm-hmm. you know, Vortex and Onyx, like the boys from the hunting public put together one uh, this year called three tips for finding bucks. And like, you talk about a crew of dudes that goes out there to places they have never been to and gets it done on, on white tails on pressured public land. Uh, you know, and, and you guys are probably familiar. I mean, they preach on habitat diversity, yep. like, you know, find an edge, you know, almost all critters are edge critters. You find habitat diversity, whether that's, Mm -hmm. you know, the edge of hardwoods in a field or just the edge of, you know, one variety of trees, like an Aspen stand inside of, you know, monotonous pines or something like that, you know, where you find that diversity of habitat critters are also going to be there. And then just terrain. I mean, terrain is what funnels critters the way you know the way they move through a a landscape if there's no topo lines on a piece of property you know good luck right Uh, so you know i would look for for places that have terrain have a little bit of habitat diversity and if you're a whitetail hunter go check out the hunting publics page if you're a western big game hunter we got an awesome one coming up with the with the hushing boys um they're covering a few different topics um and i think that one's coming out here in in just a couple weeks as far as some rifle strategies for elk and um, so really just play off, play off the folks that really know what they're doing rather than, than Dylan and I and go check out some YouTube. <laughs> yep. uh, I guys. like that answer. I don't know, man. I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at the backgrounds of, uh, your home offices there. And I think, uh, there's an, ins- a few indicators on the walls that you guys know a little bit about what you're doing there. Yep. So, uh, <laughs> yep. uh, I think, uh, yeah, you guys are doing fine. But, uh, you know, one thing also for a person that, and I'm not, you know, I guess I, I get by with it, but just some basic map reading skills, right? A lot of the stuff that um, you might see on, on a, you know, classic topographic map, you know, all the same things apply to that, that layer, that hybrid layer on, on Onyx where you can see all the top of lines. And yep. um, of course you guys have the 3D stuff coming out, which will, you know, definitely provide that, that 3D view as well. But, you know, a quick look there, you can see the lay of the land, the train, you know, saddles, ridge lines, right. whatever. Um, those, those lines are there for a reason and, and, uh, learning how to, how to read those and what they're doing. And you can check out elevation gains and see, you know, like, oh, this is going to be steeper here, or I may want to hunt here because it is steep. Cause that's going to be a natural place where the, the deer are going to maybe circumvent that to, 
take a yep. more gentle approach yep. or whatever. The other thing too with that is like one thing that that I've like kind of been doing in the past couple of years is when I look at the topo layer, you know, depending on the region that you're in, like in the Midwest, for example, upper Midwest, I can look at just the topo layer. And if I know that I've got, you know, big ridges, like say in the driftless, you know, region of Wisconsin, and then you got water in the bottom, you pretty much know what kind of habitat is going to be in the bottom without having to look at your satellite layer. You know, you're going to have oaks mm-hmm. up on top. You're going to have some grassy drainages down in the bottom. And then you can almost like, quickly start eliminating areas which i think is more important even than picking areas that you actually want to hunt like it's almost better yeah i find to like throw stuff away than add it to your repertoire and and that's one thing that like i, f- I feel like has worked out really well just from a uh like purely from a cut it or add it standpoint into a place that you want to yep. like be in yeah, I mean, and, you know, you're talking about water there, Eric, and, you know, I think uh, nothing uh, lets you know if water is there, like, ground-truthing it, right? But yep. sometimes, you know, depending on the terrain and the satellite imagery, water may not be visible, so you can go to that, you know, that straight top of layer, and, you know, you might find, you yeah. know, a water that otherwise might be hidden underneath the canopy of trees, and like I said, it's sometimes it's there, sometimes yeah. it's not. But. Another thing I want to pick your guys' brain on, too, is is uh, the burn layer. I know that was something that we even, like, sh- exchanged a couple emails on as far as, like, spitballing some, some ideas and whatnot. And I think that's something that is super cool, you know, obviously in the West. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of benefits there that people, like, that are in the know of, of you know, hunting tactics and whatnot are going to obviously ring true with them but for folks who you know might not be familiar yeah what would the what i guess would you guys just want to go into the significance of a burn area and the different age classes of maybe something that's literally on fire right now versus something that has burned say like three five years ago yeah for sure and i think um people have different opinions on like what classifies as like the target rich environment for like a you know a burn that they want to go check out but essentially what the burn layer is we've we've got two different layers we've got current wildfires um which actually this year we up in, here in montana have had very few fires up until very recently um now we do have quite a few fires so if you turn that layer on zoom out you'll be able to see where active current wildfires are right now so not only is that you know helpful for if i've got an elk hunt in a unit, but then I pull it up and I see like, okay, a quarter of my unit is burning right now. Like you might not be able to access that country. You know, there might be a ton of boots on the ground and they're trying to fight that fire, et cetera. You might have to pivot your, your plan. So that one's helpful and it's updated pretty much daily. So you can daily go in and see the parameters of that fire, like where it's spreading, um, so on and so forth. So we've got that one. And then we have the historic wildfire. Yep. Uh, that's the one where it will show you the parameters of the fire and the year. So, you know, we've got different color codes based on like the, you know, how old a burn was, um, but it will show you the year. And so with that, like, if you want more information on it, you can tap on that burn, just like anywhere on the map with anything else, you can tap on it, more information will pull up. It'll show you the exact acreage of that fire, you know, the year that it burned, um, the fire name, some other notes, et cetera. Um, for me personally, and this is all personal experience, again, um, we have a lot of resources on our website for like ambassadors takes on this and their input. But for me personally, um, I typically have noticed some really good uh, potential in like burns that are say two to five years old. Yep. Um, and it really just depends. It, there's a lot of factors that go into it of like how hot was the fire? How quickly was it put out? Was it put out by man? Like there's a lot of factors that go into it. So it's, it's a pretty broad guideline of what I found, but you know, two year old fire um, with good habitat, with good rainfall, the next season, you're going to start to see some growth. Um, It's going to be minimal, but it's going to be rich, you know, green grass popping through the bottom. Um, You know, three to four years is where I would probably optimize it myself. Yeah. Again, people might have different opinions on that, but that's kind of what I've found here in Montana with a few that I've hunted. Yeah. Uh, but really, it also just goes back to like the the transition areas, like Jared was just talking about in the white toe woods. Yeah. You know, you've got habitat, you've got like very thick forest here, and then you've got a burn, and there's this transition period where I've run into a lot of elk, and so it's you know transitioning from 
the thick timber that wasn't burned to the burn and back and forth. So I think a lot of it kind of correlates to the whitetail woods and the, the habitat, you know, diversification as you, um, yeah. Jared said. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree with that. And like here in the, the Midwest, like we kind of touched on this, I guess at the start, but like, we don't have, we don't have nearly the fire threat or cadence that you guys have out West, but we have, uh, you know, for, uh, forest cuts and timber cuts. And obviously just like there's different intensities of fires, there's different intensities of timber cuts. So something that get, that is literally being clear cut right now, that might be a little bit of a wild card for this season, but if you start planning ahead like two, three years, you know, I, I, I totally agree with that time frame, Dylan, that you just mentioned. Yep. Like, I feel like that, that three to five mark is perfect because you start to get some, just like fire affects the landscape by letting sunlight in, a timber cut does the same thing. It's just a little bit more man-made than, you know, a fire. Yeah. So, well, then, you know, sometimes they'll even, you know, burn, burn a clear cut, you know, yeah. or something like that. And I think there's a lot of obviously a lot of those nutrients are getting put back into the ground at a very you know rapid rate and like you said you've got edges that are being created you've got new growth that's you know super succulent and you know very attractive to wildlife and it was interesting hearing him you know don't talk about those burns because yeah definitely a lot of parallels Mm -hmm. a lot of parallels with the clear cut you know i grew up hunting Uh, western washington actually you guys didn't know already you know the timber cuts layer in the onyx app it only covers i I believe it's national forest lands right now so like state lands won't have their timber cuts in there but we also have that layer that you can you know quick flip on under the layers um and that also gives you whether it was like a a thinning a clear cut you know whatever type of cut it was as well as the year i've spent a lot of time on that exact layer in the black hills uh (laughs) oh really (laughs) yeah yep i I, I think there is some really, really cool data there. Like when you compare that burn layer to fire layers and how they kind of play together, I think you can, you know, we talked about eliminating stuff. I think that's a really cool way to start focusing in on the stuff that you do want to be at. So, yeah. What, what other unique layers do you guys put to use in the hunt app? Man, I've been so, so I'm in two weeks, I go to North Dakota, and one of the ones that I've been looking at a little bit is the roadless. You brought archery, archery, either either deer tag. So or I, I, I or? put in for that and didn't draw it. So instead, I'm looking for uh, some whitetail spots. And one of the things that I'm looking at out there is the roadless layer. Um, and not necessarily as that relates to whitetails, because I think whitetails, you know, actually in that region are going to prefer the areas where, you know, people are because that's where you've got your your active you know farming operation so i'm almost like reverse engineering what you guys have you know if i was mule deer hunting i'd be looking for those pockets that are very roadless but since i'm chasing whitetails i'm almost like looking for the areas where there are roads because where there's roads there's farms where there's farms there's food you, and then there's going to be deer and I'm going to shoot some arrows in the air and it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> Legless. Yes. Yeah. I don't know. I think I primarily use probably, you know, the, the basic functionality, right. You know, kind of, kind of the big three, um, and just, and sort around, but yeah, we've played with that, that timber layer. Yep. Um, you know, the, the cuts in, uh, in, uh, in Wisconsin here. And, and it's interesting. I mean, you can, just utilize different things to, I guess, adjust your strategy. Like even though we were on a hunt last year that, you know, somewhat fell apart at the seams, but part of our strategy actually was, you know, we were in a somewhat of a, you know, remote area, but there was some limited agriculture that bumped up to uh, the public that had zero agriculture, right? So you've kind of got really identified, at least in our opinion, we didn't get to ground truth it, but, you know, probably a hot spot, right? Right. Where you're like, yeah, I mean, deer are going to be hitting this. Like, there's really basically none of this in the area. It's different. You know, we're talking about diversity and edges and stuff like that. And yeah. So, You've um, said a couple of times that this hunt fell apart. I, I can only imagine I know what hunt you're talking about. Yeah, you were there. Okay. You were there, Jim. We, <laughs> we sank the boat, plot twist. We tried, uh, <laughs> tried floating a river and our boat literally sank out from underneath us. Other than that, yeah. though, it was fine. Oh, every- <laughs> Everything was wrong from the start. <laughs> Good That's time. Amazing. Still, uh, still owe you a thermosel. Yeah. After, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh man. Was the boat recovered? 
Uh, yeah, she's uh, she's folded up somewhere here back at the uh, back at HQ. I don't know, put away somewhere. We took a very inflatable boat through a river stretch of river that is very prone to deflating things that hold air, and it oh. it deflated our hopes and dreams right underneath yeah. us. It yeah. did. It yep. did. Uh, you I, ever seen the movie Titanic? Yeah, <laughs> it was very similar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but Rose and uh, <laughs> I. Uh, yeah. Appreciate you holding me like that. No, I yeah, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, but, but you I, know, I use uh, getting back to, getting back to Onyx. I use uh, the private land, even though I hunt predominantly, I'd say public land. You know, yep. during the archery season here, uh, I use private land as a big part of my public land strategy, though. Oh yeah, and I I think that's something that you guys kind of alluded to at the front end, like. It, and you can almost visualize it too from like somebody in the Midwest that all of a sudden they see a giant area of like where it's a park or whatever. That's obviously gonna when you open up Onyx, you're gonna see that's gonna be the first. That's like a focal point draws everyone's interest to it. Rather than finding those big like ten thousand acre chunks lately, the past like couple of years, if Eric. I, I'm if you can find stuff that's the smaller the better, you know, in my opinion. Smaller point, one access, you're Mark, set. Mark is Mark M C Ryan. Can Mark we, can we cut that out? Yep. He's drawn the line. Out. I yep. agree. No, He's that's up. that's a super solid tip. And I mean, really just private edges in general. Um, you know, anywhere that you can find a spot where, you know, <laughs> private private land is inevitably less pressured than public land. So, you know, getting on that boundary used to be a, 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 you know, a fickle thing to do. It was right. hard to know like, Oh, is this actually the fence? Or maybe there was no fence and you're like, where, where is this line? So riding those, those private lines, but that's gonna, I'll give away one of my secrets I use as well, uh, relating to private property. Um, I love knocking on doors. I love talking yep. to landowners and trying to get permission. I don't know. I, I almost find it entertaining. It's almost like a game, yep. um, you know, to see if you can get permission and, so I've, I've never been afraid to knock on doors and, and how I do it a lot of times, especially when trying to get permission for, you know, like whitetails in the Midwest. I mean, for the most part, it's like good luck. Yep. Um, but like when I was down at, at school in Iowa there, my aunt's farm was a couple hour drive. So it wasn't real doable to hunt after, after class on a weekday or what have you. So I would pair, you know, you have to pay for white pages these days, but I would, you know, pay the five ninety nine a month for the right. white page app for a couple months and pair that with on X. And, you know, obviously you can, you get the tax address and the landowner's names through on X. Then you just punch either one of those in the white pages and, uh, my best strategy was to find folks because white pages age categorizes folks, right? Yep. I know so exactly I, where you're going with this. I would find folks that were 70 plus yep, and yep. I would ignore everybody else. I would not even contact them because, you know, they were still hunting. They had kids that were hunting, whatever it was the case. But you find those older folks with property. If they don't have grandkids out there, they're usually pretty dang receptive, especially if you're willing to be like, oh, yeah, I'd love to come help out on the farm or or do this, that, or the other thing. Like yep. they're usually like, oh yeah, we'll have cookies waiting for you too. <laughs> yep, yep. Uh, so like oh, Eric, that was one cookies. thing I really <laughs> dove in on. Uh, that's pretty yep. slick right there. That's 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 a hot tip. Yeah, that that's is. a good one. I'll, that it is. I'll bring up something else that Onyx is extremely handy for is I find um at times uh, I've actually encountered on several occasions people take the liberty of posting uh private property signs uh on uh on 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 access points of property that actually isn't private. Now I'm sure it's just a honest mistake, uh, but uh, y no, yeah, that was that was sarcasm, by the right, way. Right. So um, <laughs> and yeah, and I've actually hunted things, you know, one year, and then you come back and it's posted. You're like, wait, no, what? what am and then you're like, no, yeah, it's still public. Somebody yep. just knows this yeah. is a good or, spot too. You'll find that a ton, like where it's a hundred yards or fifty yards. Mm -hmm. on the wrong side you know like it's close like they they know they're close but they're still trying to you know dissuade you and, and give themselves that buffer yeah yep. or sometimes it might be uh uh conveniently close to one of those really small access points it actually is private where that sign is posted it's just really adjacent to you know that small access point right. that would maybe cause a person to overlook it yep. yeah see i'm giving away these are you know, look at you, Mark. You turned a new leaf. Not fully. And like, not fully. Jared, Jared and myself, we went on a hunt last year with some work guys where, I mean, we were hunting little slivers of public and yep. there's no fences. Like, there's no private signs. There's no public. There's no fences. So, like, 
literally where I shot my, my buck last year, actually that buck that you can see over my shoulder with Jared, it would have been impossible, you know, yeah. like it, 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 it's not because I worked for on X and I'm pushing it. Like it would have been impossible to be successful on that hunt. We were hunting a quarter section by a half section with zero fences yep. and it was a piece of public BLM surrounded. It was like a peninsula surrounded by private. And we, Jared happened to turn that buck up right in the, the bottom of public. And without like, we would have just a assumed it was private. B, we never would have been there because we would have, wouldn't have been confident enough to hike into that spot and see like on the pack out, like there's no way we would have been able to differentiate. Okay. We are on public right now versus private. Cause there's no, there was no markers. No, yep. nothing. Interesting. Well, I, I, I was going to say, and some of the stuff can be, you know, so tight that, you know, you can look on the, on the map and see your location and it can be so tight that you're actually maybe using your range finder to range the animal and doing oh, a little yeah. bit of math and going, yep, you know, it's still yep. on public, you know, we can, we can shoot. Yep. If I'm That's remembering that tool comes in, cause you can check that range finder, go right on the app at the line distance and be like, okay, yep, exactly. That's yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If I'm remembering that hunt correctly, didn't you guys have that up on your Instagram story? You yeah. guys like shot, I forget how many crazy bucks in a, in a short amount of time. Like it just looked like a blast. That was a fun one. Yeah, we, we <laughs> all of us ended up filling tags that week. Um, yeah, that was that was a fun hunt. I tagged out with that buck on the first day. Um, and then, Jared, we shot your buck the next day. A couple other guys shot deer the same day that I did. It was it was a fun hunt. That is very cool. Nice. Yeah, I mean, like, that just speaks uh, another another thing with Onyx is, like, planning an out-of-state trip with some buddies. Like, A, it's it's not expensive to drive right. across state lines with three other dudes and and go on a hunt. And it's just, like, you're able to plan it from your couch. You can yep. send waypoints to one another, like, text a waypoint, like, hey, check out this access point. Like, planning a trip with three other buddies to go across state lines and go on a deer hunt, like – who cares what the size of the rack is you come home with? It's just like the experience and going out there, seeing new country and yep. you know, taking five, six days out and get, get out there and check out some new country. Yep. True that. Mm-hmm. True that. Absolutely. I'm pretty basic with my use of uh, Onyx thus far, but the one thing that I have been very curious about is the off-road uh, stuff that you guys have now. Uh, do you guys find, do you find that a lot of people that are, hunting are also using the off-road section to find trails to access points way back uh on onyx or do you find that that's more recreational just off-roaders trying to find some rock crawling and wheeling spots it's it's definitely a little bit more recreational and the reason i say that is we essentially have the same data in the hunt app um by the same i mean similar data that can be used for the same purpose um it's not visually the same but Mm -hmm. um, we call it the MVUM layer. And you turn that thing on, it'll show you the roads trail. And if you tap on it, it'll give you gate open dates, closure dates, if they're available, et cetera. So, you know, that the off-road is uh, definitely an expansion um, of the hunt product where we started. And it's, it's kind of geared toward a different market. And, you know, people use the hunt product for a multitude of, of different things. I know farmers who use it specifically for, you know, to run their farming business. Um, yep. And people using it for off-road and people using it in, you know, real estate and just all sorts of different facets. And the off-road market was just another one that we decided to experiment with and provide that for another audience. But yeah, essentially if you turn on the MVUM layer, it's, uh, you can find pretty much the same thing within the hunt app. That's pretty cool. And that's in the trails and rec layer menu. Yep. Yep. Cause yeah, I know like, I mean, just because something is public land doesn't mean you can drive on it. You know, I mean, and, and unfortunately, it's not like, well, hooray, we've reached public land. We can wheel anywhere we want. So um, yeah. that that adds in yet even another layer of complexity. And then you got the differences between, okay, is this the spot where you can only use a side-by-side or can you use a full-on 4x4, four four, you know, vehicle that you could drive on the road? And so anyways, the old the old Subaru is finally uh, about to come back. So I'm... I'm already trying to find spots to uh take her out and and maybe get it stuck so we're getting we're getting her back and we actually have plans maybe we'll tease out a trip that we have coming up where we're gonna jump in the old soup and get after it and chase some critters and 
That's right. Should be good. That's right. Well, well, if you need that off-road app for that Subaru to really uh, test her, to put her to the test, uh, <laughs> you, you let me know and I'll get you set up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, it uh, for sure. For sure. <laughs> We're gonna find we're gonna find some crazy trails to bring this thing on. Oh so my gosh, that uh, that that was exciting for me though when I when um I saw that you guys started adding that stuff in. You able to get ten ply tires on a Subaru these days? Oh, you can get just about anything you want on a Subaru. <laughs> Subaru is the Swiss Army knife of vehicles. You can do anything you want with it. All right, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh she's unique. I've grown to love her. I know. I, know. I need to see a I, picture. I haven't, I haven't seen the Subaru yet, I'm thinking. Okay. There's some pictures on our That'd Instagram page way back, okay. but we didn't want to we didn't want to uh overdo it, post about it too much until we we've, we've got it back. Um so it had a little bit of a uh, little bit of work being done outside of uh out of house here, so but once once it's back, I'm sure you might see it a, a little bit more again. Nice. Yeah. But very cool. Well, cool guys. I mean, I don't, I don't know if I have any more questions. I'm sure I'll come up with some others, but any, any final thoughts on, on your end? Yeah. I mean, for me, it's just like reverting back to, we've talked about a lot of different ways about how people u- utilize the app. Right. But no matter what hunt you're doing, no matter what you're doing, it's going to have a use. Like, you know, we've talked a lot about finding private public um, transition areas, boundaries, et cetera. Whereas just this past weekend, I went on a hunt with a, a mutual ambassador group of both Onyx and you guys, Vortex. And I'll tell you, there was no concern about private or public boundaries where we were. Like right. it was just vast expanse of public, but without the app, you know, first of all, like, you know, I was able to see the area ahead of time. They shared a waypoint out. I saved the map for offline use, but just so much differences in how you use the product. So, you know, we, we spot an animal drop a, a waypoint. So when you lose elevation and lose visual, you know where you're headed. Um, you know, I was successful on the pack out utilizing tracks and elevation and imagery to figure out the best of, you know, one or two ways to get it out. Um, and then it ultimately ended up, I ended up dropping the meat cause we were in the middle of the night with headlamps on, weren't really in a good spot, decided to drop the meat and come back the next day marked a waypoint i can tell you firsthand with going in there the next day with the sea of deadfall and just where it was there's no way that i would have found it without a waypoint yeah um it just everything looks the same you can't see more than 10 yards in front of you yep. and mm. so like that night without the ability to drop a waypoint there i wouldn't have been confident enough to leave it i wouldn't have left it and you know it just we kind of had to that night so it was you know, just much different uses of the same product in a much different situation. Yeah, Yeah. for sure. I mean, that sounds like a pretty gnarly hunt. And I think that's being able to see, you know, essentially see in the dark, right? Like you're on your way out. Maybe you were going, coming out a different way than you, than you went in and being able to navigate and be like, oh yeah, there's a cliff. We're going to want to not go, you know, over that or run into it and find out, you know, you you don't want to find out that you're cliffed out when you're standing at the edge of the cliff. You know, that means you have to go back. Um, and obviously, you know, it's nighttime, you're tired, you're exhausted, you're trying to get out. And so any, and it, and safety. Yeah. One, one point two, you know, we stopped, we were crossing like a shale rock, you know, they were like volleyball, beach ball size rocks that were loose and crossing it with a bunch of weight on our back. And like, we sat down and I pulled up the app, zoomed in on the imagery. And I was like, guys, there is what looks like to be a trail, you know, right below us. It was no more than 15 yards below us, but we were so you know, you you have headlamps on, you're just trying to get out yep. without huh. taking the time to look at it. Like we would have been crossing another mile of scree field through deadfall and just miserableness Jeez. when I looked and it's like, we literally went 12 yards down and we hit a trail that we were able to follow. Did so you, like those little things in the dark, you just don't, you don't know. Did you actually hear the angel sounds when you like t- <laughs> looked at your map and saw that trail? Yeah, it was, it was a incredible, um, spike uh, <laughs> i was like yeah we're, we're home and then we you know it led into another bottom full of deadfall so it didn't oh. you know, ultimately help too much but <laughs> that half mile we thought we were on uh we were on cloud nine just yeah. basically down a trail you're on one of those things at the airport where like you walk and the ground is also yeah. moving with you <laughs> yes mm, yeah. yes oh man yeah. uh yeah anything that will help you navigate not being a deadfall, I'm for. I'm for that. 
but eh, cool. I, I share, I share no pity for him. I mean, he got to go out and uh, shoot a critter <laughs> in August. Like, Oh yeah. That's no, very cool. Uh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad you had a hellacious pack out. It's good for you. Builds character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That way, when I come, uh, that way, when I get a phone call from Jared here in about a month saying he's got a bowl down, I'm my <laughs> legs are well underneath me by then. There you go. I like that. That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, guys, appreciate the time. Eric, did you have something you're going to say there? Nope. Cool. Pre- appreciate the time, all the information, such an exciting and awesome product. And it's, it's to hear the uh, developments that you guys have uh, in process. I mean, just like, I mean, I thought it was great already, and it just sounds like it's getting even better. So um, just awesome stuff. Super useful tool. Uh, If you use it, you know it. Uh, If you haven't used it or you're a new hunter or, like Eric said, if you're a a longtime hunter but but haven't used it, man, definitely check it out. Um, It's just going to be an invaluable tool in your hunting toolbox. And and really, there's a variety of applications inside and outside of hunting as well. So good stuff there. Jim? All right. All right. Well, Well... Yeah. Thanks, everybody, for listening, as usual. And uh, if you have any questions, it sounds like these guys have the crew back at HQ to answer those, so give them a call. Um, And, uh, yeah, otherwise, we'll catch everybody next time. Thanks a ton, you guys, for joining us. Yeah, thanks, guys. I really appreciate you guys having us on. Yep. Thank you, guys, for the opportunity, and uh, chat soon. Good luck on upcoming hunts. Yeah, Yeah, you guys, too. You, too, guys. as well. We'll keep you posted. All right. right. Bye, everybody. Bye. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.